Good morning and welcome to class 12, the final class in our series on the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Today we will be looking at chapter 13, the final chapter in this letter, and we will conclude by stepping back and looking at the letter as a whole. I'm Father Patrick Cheng, the theologian in residence at St. Thomas Church Fifth Avenue, and it's great to have you join us today. Today is the seventh Sunday of Easter, the final Sunday in the Easter liturgical season. Next Sunday will be Pentecost. And today's Psalm in the Eucharistic lectionary is taken from Psalm one, the first Psalm. And it has this beautiful image of a tree that is planted by, by a stream or by water. And we will take a look at verses one through three of Psalm one says, happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on his law day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. And I find this image of a tree planted by a stream of water to be very powerful. It represents our own um, beings as we reflect upon Holy Scripture, just like Psalm 1 talks about those who meditate on the law of the Lord. Those of us that meditate on the Bible, on Scripture, are like these trees that are planted by streams of water, that we will bear fruit in due season, um, our leaves will not wither and everything that we do shall prosper. So I think this image of a tree that is rooted is a very good way to end our journey through 2 Corinthians. So I invite you to say with me the collect of the day as we begin our class. Let us pray. O oh God, the King of glory, who has exalted thine only son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph unto thy kingdom in heaven, we beseech thee, Leave us not comfortless, but send to us thine Holy Ghost to comfort us and exalt us unto the same place whither our Savior Christ is gone before, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the same Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. Amen. So let us continue with our journey through 2 Corinthians, and we finish today. Uh, with our study of this epistle. The overall theme, as uh, you know from the last 11 classes, has been that this letter is about St. Paul defending his ministry, defending his ministry as an apostle, defending his ministry to his beloved church in Corinth. Um, these super apostles have come and infiltrated his church, and they have, um, you know, they have said to the people in Corinth that Paul was not a true apostle. And so this letter was about his countering uh, what he's heard about the church. And so last time we studied chapter 12, uh, which talked about Paul's visions and revelations, in particular, um, Paul's vision of the third heaven. And last time was the end of the famous fool's speech which was um, sort of the culmination of this letter where Paul says that he is a fool, but a fool for Christ. And furthermore, last time we reached the summit of this epistle, the high point of this letter, um, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, the key points from last time, chapter 12, was that, as I mentioned, Paul had this vision. He was caught up 14 years ago from his writing of this letter, he was caught up to the third heaven, uh, sort of the highest level of heaven where that was where God was. Um, and Paul said that in order for him not to be too exalted, to become too conceited, um, you know, he, God gave him a thorn in his flesh. Now, scholars have debated, readers have debated for uh, to millennia, what Paul meant by a thorn in his flesh. Did he mean some physical ailment? Did, did he mean some spiritual ailment, some other kind of um, thorn, metaphorical or otherwise? We don't know. 
Um, but we do know that Paul said that he asked three times for the thorn to be removed, and Jesus refused his request. And Jesus said that his grace, Jesus's grace was sufficient, and that power is made perfect in weakness. And this, I think, is the key verse, is the high point of 2 Corinthians, that power is made perfect in weakness, just as God's power is made perfect in the cross, in the ultimate um, powerlessness, if you will. Um, it is also perfection in terms of leading to the resurrection. Then Paul says that he is going to visit the Corinthians again, and he reiterates again that he does not want to burden them with financial costs. He refuses to take money from them, uh, but this is a follow-up to his request that they take a collection for the church in Jerusalem. And then um, Paul admits that he has fears. He's afraid of what he'll see when he goes to Corinth for this third visit. And so this is a summary of what we talked about last time uh, for chapter 12. And again, uh, verse 9 of chapter 12 is really the key verse, I think, of understanding the entire epistle. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. This is what Paul is replying or is responding uh, or is quoting Jesus as saying. Arche soi he carismu. Um, you know, my grace is sufficient for you. Hegar dunamis in asthenea teletai, because power is perfected in weakness. And again, this notion of power being perfected in weakness is a reflection of the cross, which is an overview of this letter. Uh, the notion of the cross, where God's power is manifested in what seems like weakness. Um, is basically Paul's argument that he may seem weak, but in fact, he is in this weakness, he is manifesting God's power. So this time, chapter 13 is the final chapter of this epistle, and we will hear Paul talk about his upcoming third visit to Corinth. So this is the third time that he's visited uh, Corinth or that he will be planning to visit them. Um, and the main theme of today's chapter is be prepared. Uh, you know, in a previous class, I talked about how as a Boy Scout, and those of you that are familiar with scouting knows that the motto for the Scouts is be prepared, right? Uh, be prepared. And so Paul's purpose in closing this epistle is to, uh, is to warn the Corinthians that he's coming and that they should be prepared. So, Today's agenda, we will be looking at chapter 13, uh, verses 1 through 13, uh, the entire chapter. Paul is preparing for his upcoming third visit. He gives them a warning, and he also instructs the Corinthians to examine themselves, to look within. Um, and then he closes with a farewell, not a long farewell, because he will be visiting them soon, and then a very powerful benediction which is probably the most developed Trinitarian benediction in the New Testament. And then after talking about chapter 13, we will step back, as I said, and review the epistle as a whole, take a look at 2 Corinthians, also in the context of 1 Corinthians, and uh, we will conclude with looking at our entire journey through St. Paul's correspondence with his beloved Corinthian church. And then we will close with questions and answers. So let us talk about Paul's third visit. Um, he has visited them twice before, and he will visit uh, Corinth, Roman Corinth. Again, this reconstruction of Roman Corinth, a very beautiful cosmopolitan city uh, akin to the New York of uh, its day. And remember that Roman Corinth was only about 100 years old when Paul founded the church in Corinth, that um, Greek Corinth uh, was also a metropolis, but had been destroyed by the Roman Empire for its role in a rebellion. And so only about 100 years before Paul, uh, you know, arrived in Corinth, uh, the Romans had rebuilt Corinth and repopulated it. And so it was very much a new city uh, during the time of Paul's ministry to the Corinthians. And so Paul's first visit took place during his second missionary journey. This is a uh, 
uh, recap of what we have talked about before. This happened around the year 50 um, AD, 50 CE, uh, where Paul founded the church in Corinth after coming from Athens. Um, so that was his first visit to Corinth. Um, then his second visit occurred during his third missionary journey. So after founding the church in Corinth, staying there for about 18 months, Paul returned uh, to Antioch, and then he began his third missionary journey and went to Ephesus. And it was at Ephesus that he heard that the church in Corinth was having problems. He sent them an initial letter, which is lost. And then from Ephesus, he wrote what is known today as 1 Corinthians, even though it was his second letter, we know it as 1 Corinthians. Um, and then after writing 1 Corinthians um, in the year 55 or so, he heard that things were getting even worse in Corinth. And so he made an emergency second visit to Corinth from Ephesus. And this is what you see on the map. So the second visit was after his first visit of founding Corinth. He left Ephesus, visited them, and this was a very bad visit. Um, it was sort of a sorrowful, tearful visit. He left, he said, I will come back and see you again. My hope is to see you twice. I'll come back, go up to Macedonia, come back down again. But then what happens is he never makes that trip. And instead he writes them a letter. And he writes them the letter because he is upset at them. And he says that he doesn't want to go again um, because he would, he would be upset, they would be upset. But the Corinthians get very mad at him for not visiting him again, visiting them again. And they accuse him of being untruthful. And that is the impetus for this letter, the uh, second letter to the Corinthians. And so here we have the third letter uh, or the third visit uh, that is coming from uh, second Corinthians. As you remember, Paul leaves Ephesus, he goes to Troas, um, doesn't see Titus, he then goes to Macedonia, and then it is from Macedonia that he writes um, 2 Corinthians, and at the end of this letter, he says, I will visit you, I will come see you for a third time. So this might be, you know, as you can tell, it's a very complicated history, and so um, none of this you can readily discern from just reading 2 Corinthians, and so this background is very important. Um, so what's important for you to know is that in this final chapter, chapter 13, uh, Paul talks about going to visit the Corinthian church for the third time. And this third visit will occur in the year 57 CE. Um, scholars think that 2 Corinthians was written right before that around the year 56. And once he's in Corinth, scholars think that that's where he wrote his letter to the Romans. Um, and so that's sort of a history of Paul's journey uh, to Corinth. So Paul begins this final chapter with a warning to them. He basically warns them that he will be visiting them and they better shape up, all right? And this comes from Paul's fears. Paul is afraid of what he will find. And he uses the word fear, phobos, in the previous chapter. And what is Paul afraid of? Well, he is afraid of bad behaviors that the church in Corinth uh, will exhibit when he goes to see them. And these are things that um, I think, uh, as I mentioned before, that these are bad behaviors of um, you know, many church communities even today. And so it's nothing new, but last time he talks about things like eris, like strife, or zelos, like jealousy, or thumoi, outbursts of anger, right? Um, or eritheai, uh, selfish ambition. Um, katalaliai, slander, um, sithurismoi, um, gossip, thusioses, uh, fisioses, um, pride, um, akatastasiai, disorder or chaos, akatharsia, impurity, porneia, uh, sexual immorality or fornication, and aselgea, or licentiousness. So Paul is saying that he's heard about these bad behaviors, um, this, as you may remember, those of you that uh, sort of uh, um, remember way back a year ago in our series on 1 Corinthians, um, a main theme of 1 Corinthians was that the church was really divided, right? That they were um, not one body, but were separate bodies, and there was a lot of strife, um, and, you know, some Corinthians thought they were 
better than others, especially the ones who were rich and they refused to eat with the poor members of um, their community. And there were issues about sexual immorality. Um, so again, this goes back to 1 Corinthians. And so this is what Paul is afraid that he'll find when he goes there for his third journey. And so um, he is saying, so he warns them saying that when I come here, I better not see this. And so here we have um, this, uh, the beginning of uh, chapter 13 from the God's word translation. Paul says, this is the third time that I will be visiting you. Every accusation must be verified by two or three witnesses. I already warned you when I was with you the second time. And even though I'm not there now, I'm warning you again. When I visit you again, I won't spare you. That goes for all those who formerly led sinful lives as well as for all the others. Since you want proof that Christ is speaking through me, that's what you'll get. Christ isn't weak in dealing with you. Instead, he makes his power felt among you. He was weak when he was crucified, but by God's power, he lives. We are weak with him, but by God's power, we will live for you with his help. Okay, so this is Paul's warning. And so Paul says that um, basically this is the third time I am coming to you. Um, and so he's saying Triton, the third time that he's coming to you. As we just mentioned, uh, Paul has visited the Corinthian church twice before, would be the third time. And we know this from the Acts of the Apostles that outlines Paul's journey. And we also know this from certain fragments from his letters um, to the Corinthians. Um, and then Paul quotes uh, Hebrew scripture. He quotes uh, Deuteronomy, uh, this interesting sentence that says, any charge must be sustained by the evidence of two or three witnesses. It's kind of odd here, right? Um, what Deuteronomy is saying is that in order to prove that someone has done wrong, it's not enough just to have one witness. You have to have two or three. Now, this was very unusual in the Greco-Roman world. In Greek law and Roman law, all you needed to indict someone uh, or convict someone was the testimony of one witness. But under Jewish law, under Hebrew law, um, you needed to have two or three witnesses. So Paul says that I'm coming to you, and then he talks, he cites this procedural rule of due process for two or three witnesses. And then he says, I warned those who sinned previously and all the others, and I warned them now while I'm absent, as I did when I was present on my second visit. Remember, his second visit was this tearful, sorrowful, sorrowful visit that didn't do very well. Um, he warned them then that if I come again, I will not be lenient. And you have the Greek word face, face which is to spare or to be lenient. So why does Paul talk about this rule, this legal procedural rule of um, a charge being sustained by the evidence of two or three witnesses? Well, um, and by the way, the Greek word for witness here is marturon. Um, this is where you get the word martyr from. So martyrs are those who bear witness um, to God, to Christ, to the Holy Spirit through their death. Um, but the reason why he does this is scholars think that he is sort of taking this rule about needing two or three witnesses and applying it to his numbers of visits, right? So he said, I've already visited you twice. This will be the third time. And if things aren't good the third time, I will have grounds to indict you, to convict you of your wrongdoing. Do you see that? He's basically using Hebrew legal procedure by saying, you know, I will have seen it with my own eyes, you know, two or three times, and therefore I will have grounds to be not lenient with you. And so taking a quick look at this, uh, here is uh, Deuteronomy 19.15, this is where the rule comes from. Deuteronomy says, a single witness shall not suffice, suffice to convict a person of any crime or wrongdoing in connection with any offense that may be committed. Only on the evidence of two or three witnesses shall a charge be sustained, right? And so in the Hebrew on the left side, you see um, alpi, you know, on the mouth of. So instead of evidence, it's really saying a word that comes from the mouth of. Then shene, two witnesses, edim, o, alpi, 
shelosha edim yakum dabar, or from the mouth of three witnesses shall be established a case or a word. Um, and as some of you know, actually the older Hebrew Bible was actually written in Greek, the Septuagint. And it's the same thing. It says epistomatos, on the mouth of duo marturon, two witnesses. Again, you see the word witness, marturon. Kai epistomatos, and upon the mouth triam marturon, of three witnesses, um, stafesetai shall be confirmed panhrema, any word. So again, this idea that you need two or three witnesses. And so the Greek word for witness, martus, uh, this is where martyr, martyr comes from. Um, and Phaedomai, uh, to be spare, to, to spare someone, to be lenient, uh, to put them on parole, if you will. Um, so this, this language is very legalistic that Paul uses, which makes sense, right, if he's talking about potential conviction of the Corinthians. Then Paul goes on to say, why am I going to be so tough on you? Because you desire proof that Christ is speaking in me, right? He says to the Corinthians, you want proof, uh, dokimen, um, that Christ is speaking in me. So as you may remember, earlier in this letter, the Corinthians, through the super apostles, are saying, hey, Paul, I want you to prove that you are speaking, you know, Christ is speaking through you, that you are a true apostle. And he's like, okay, if you want proof, I will show you proof in how tough I am to you. And he's saying that Christ is not weak, right, asthene, um, in dealing with you, but is powerful in you. Dunate. So this whole idea of weakness and power, you've seen this throughout this letter. And again, he's saying here that Christ is powerful in you, not so much the weakness of the cross of being crucified, right? But rather through the power of the resurrection, because Christ lives uh, through the power of God, right? And so he lives, ze ek duna, um, dunameos here, dunameos theu, through the power of God. And he says, Paul says, even though I'm weak, remember, he keeps on talking about how weak he is. He's saying, when I deal with you, I will be powerful because I am living with, um, you know, I'm living with Christ through the power of God, through the resurrection. So he's like, you want to see if Christ is spe speaking and working through me? You will see that if you don't shape up. So the Greek word proof, dokime, um, that's the Greek word for proof that the Corinthians want proof. And then we've seen this again, asthenia, or weakness, um, and power, dunamis. And this is where we get dynamite from, right? Dunamis, um, power. Um, and it is the power of the resurrection, uh, the power of the resurrected Christ um, that Paul will be channeling in his um, condemnation or not being lenient or being stern or strict with the Corinthians. Then Paul moves on to, you know, sort of this instruction to the Corinthians to examine themselves before he gets there, right? Examine yourselves, he says. And he, he goes on by saying, examine yourselves to see whether you are still in the Christian faith. Test yourselves. Don't you recognize that you are people in whom Jesus Christ lives? Could it be that you're failing the test? I hope that you will realize that we haven't failed the test. We pray to God that you won't do anything wrong. It's not that we want to prove that we've passed the test. Rather, we want you to do whatever is right, even if it seem, if we seem to have failed. We can't do anything against the truth, but only to help the truth. We're glad when we are weak and you are strong. We are also praying for your improvement. That's why I'm writing this letter while I'm not with you. When I am with you, I don't want to be harsh by using the authority that the Lord gave me. The Lord gave us this authority to help you, not to hurt you. So Paul is telling them, not only does he give them a warning, he's asking them to examine themselves, to test themselves, to see if they are in fact behaving badly as he thinks they are. So he says, examine yourselves, um, peirazite, examine yourselves. Um, test yourselves, dokimazite. These two words, perazite and dokimazite, are synonyms, very much like examining, checking out, testing. And note that the word he autus, yourselves, appears several times here. Um, it's really important. He's emphasizing examine yourselves. Why is he doing this? Because 
up until this point, the Corinthians and the super apostles have told Paul to prove himself, to examine himself. And now he's turning the tables on them. He's telling them to examine themselves. And he's saying, you know, do you realize, can you confirm that Jesus Christ is in you? Um, unless, of course, you are failing to meet the test. He uses the Greek word adokimoi, uh, unqualified, to fail. Um, and he says this kind of sarcastically, you know, because he expects the Corinthians to say, of course, of course, Jesus is in us. You know, how could we fail this test? And so then he says kind of snidely, he's like, I hope you will find out that we have not failed, right? So he's basically saying that, Corinthians, if you feel like you have not failed the test, then obviously I have not failed. Because who taught you about Jesus Christ first? It was I who taught you about Jesus, not the super apostles, right? So he's saying, examine yourselves, ask yourselves whether Jesus is in you. And if Jesus is in with you, then you should realize that my ministry is authentic because I was the one that taught you about Jesus, okay? Um, and so again, the tables are turned. The Corinthians are saying to Paul, prove yourself. And Paul is saying, no, you prove yourself. You examine, you test yourself. So the perazo, to examine, that's the Greek word for examine. And dokimazo, we've seen this before, the word to, to test. Um, and then also this word um, to fail a test, right? Um, adokimos, um, a means not, adokimos. Um, so, uh, you know, to fail to pass a test. Um, and then Paul says, but we pray to God that you may not do anything wrong. Kakon, uh, the Greek word for wrong, that we may appear to have met the test, but that, not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, kalon, what is right, what is good, what is beautiful, though we may have seemed to have failed. So this part is a little hard to understand. Um, basically, Paul is saying that I'm praying that you do the right thing. You don't do anything wrong. And why I'm doing this is not to show that I've done something right, that, that we have met the test, right? Paul is saying, the reason why I want this is that I want you to do what's right. So basically, Paul is saying, if you change your mind, if you repent, and you say that, look, I'm sorry, but I did not do the right thing, and I will make amends going forward, Paul says that's good enough, even though that doesn't give me the chance to discipline you. You know, I haven't had a chance to be strict. Um, but that's okay. I may have seemed to have failed, but because you repented, um, that's fine. And Paul says, because I can't do anything against the truth. I'm only for the truth, the aletheos, right? So basically, Paul's saying, however you get there in terms of repenting, whether, you know, I, whether it's through my discipline or your repentance, that's good with me. So kakos, uh, kakos is wrong or bad or evil. And kalos, just one letter difference, is right or good or beautiful. And so he is encouraging, encouraging the Corinthians to do the right thing. Um, and then the aletheia is the truth. That's all that Paul cares about. Um, and then Paul says basically that we rejoice when we are weak and you are strong. So even if Paul seems like he's weak, that he hasn't disciplined them, and they are strong, as long as they've repented, that's what he prays for. And he prays that they may become perfect, katartisin. Now, this, this word katartisin, if you see in the Greek, um, uh, it's defined here literally as maturity. Um, I like to think of it as uh, being restored or restoration. So that, you know, they've sort of, they backslid, right? And so basically, he's praying that they are restored to how they were um, before when Paul was with them. And so then Paul says, so I write these things when I am away from you so that when I come, I may not have to be severe, right? He doesn't want to be severe. The Greek word is apotomos. Um, he doesn't want to be severe in using this authority, this exousion, this power that he has. He wants to use that power um, that the Lord has given him for building them up, right? The oikodome, um, so that he wants to build them up and not to tear them down, right? Not to kathai resin, not to tear them down. Um, so again, the katartisis is this idea of perfection or restoration, to go back to how you once were. Um, and that's what Paul's praying for. And the, the apatomos is, he doesn't wanna be severe to them, right? He doesn't wanna be 
all you know, not lenient to discipline them. Um, and again, he says he wants to use his power to build them up, the oikodome. Um, and we've seen this word before, oikos is household. So it's a literal and metaphorical building up, to build up a house or to build them up. Um, instead of on the opposite, the kathairesis, or to tear them down. Paul doesn't like doing that, even though he may seem strong in doing that. He would much rather have them, rather build them up when he visits them. So he doesn't want to tear them down. So I close the section about self-examination. Some of you may be familiar with this, the examine of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Um, those of you that um, had taken classes from Father Spencer, who very much likes uh, St. Ignatius's um, spiritual exercises and the examine, know that um, St. Ignatius had, uh, had put together this daily prayer practice called the examine. And I don't know if some of you have done this um, or do this now. Uh, perhaps you can go ahead and, uh, you know, comment in the chat box if you have. But, you know, Paul's instruction to the Corinthians to examine themselves is something that's helpful for us, too. And this may be helpful for you if you are looking for a way to do enrich your prayer life, um, that every night you can do what um, St. Ignatius had um, taught which is with the Ignatian examine, it's a five-step process. Uh, the first step is to pray, to take a moment to center yourself, right? To, to pray, to breathe, to take a moment to become aware of God's presence um, and God's presence in yourself, in your surroundings. Then secondly, uh, to think, to examine yourself and think about what you are grateful for, your gratitude. What are, what are you especially thankful for for the day. So, so ideally this takes place at night, right? Before you go to bed, you center yourself, find God's presence with you. Then you think about what you're grateful for, for the day. And then you review, you go through the entire day in your mind and you think about what brought you joy and what challenged you, what was difficult for you, right? So do you see this is a self-examination of the day's events? And then you sort of turn to God, right? You, you take a look at all this and then you think, well, what could I have done or said differently? Where did I come up short? You know, what, what could I have done to be better? How can I improve, right? That's step four. And then step five is you look forward to tomorrow. You know, what spirit do I want, want to enter in tomorrow? So this, this very simple five step, step process is a way that you can examine yourself each and every night. Um, and it's a, it's a way of praying that um, St. Ignatius of Loyola taught us. Um, and if you want, uh, if you're curious about this and want to have um, some, uh, you know, sort of uh, additional instruction, uh, this is a book uh, Jim Manny uh, wrote called The Prayer That Changes Everything, Discovering the Power of St. Ignatius Loyola's Examine. And so you can feel free to come back to this on YouTube to um, see the title of this book, but it's a very small but helpful book on the examine. So St. Paul's instruction to the Corinthians to examine themselves is something that is helpful for each of us uh, today and every day. Then Paul ends with his farewell. You know, I'll see you soon. Uh, the normal closing of a letter and then this benediction, uh, which is, as I mentioned before, one of the most developed Trinitarian benedictions in the New Testament. Um, so Paul says, he closes this letter with, with that, brothers and sisters, I must say goodbye. Make sure that you improve, accept my encouragement, share the same attitude and live in peace. The God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All of God's holy people greet you. May the Lord Jesus Christ's goodwill, God's love, and the Holy Spirit's presence be with all of you. So in many ways, just like the beginning of this letter that followed sort of the, the normal format, the standard format for letters, this follows the standard format for letters as well in terms of the farewell, instructions, uh, how to behave, and then just some kind of encouragement at the end. And so we look at the Greek word and he says, finally, loipon, brothers and sisters, adelphoi, 
So, so remember towards the end of this letter after chapter nine, um, you know, chapters 10 through 12, Paul changes tone and he's very angry, but then he ends with sort of a very positive tone. He calls them brothers and sisters, Adelphoi, and then he says farewell. Now it's interesting, the NRSV translate this as farewell. The Greek literally is kairate, which is to rejoice. So it's actually very positive. Finally, rejoice. Um, sometimes rejoice, kairate, is used as farewell, but it's more often used as greetings. Um, but so some translators say farewell. Um, and then he instructs them on a number of things, put things in order, listen to my appeal, agree with one another, live in peace. Um, and if you do that, the God of love and peace will be with you and greet one another. So the as pas um, you know, greet one another, uh, alelus, one another with a holy kiss. Hagio, hagio is holy and kiss is uh, philemati. Um, and then all the saints greet you. And here saints, hagioi, um, as you may remember in the Greek, really means the other Christians. So not so much the saints that we think of in terms of the sort of all the saints and angels in heaven, but really all the saints, all the other Christians here in Macedonia greet you. So again, the word kairete uh, is rejoice, um, could be farewell also. Um, and Paul gives them final instructions, right? The kairete to rejoice. Um, also the kat, uh, katartizeste. Um, this is the word that we had before, to be restored. It's like polishing silver, right? Um, before Holy Week or before the Easter Vigil, you know, you've got the um, silverware that's, uh, you know, needs to be polished and re restored to its original splendor. Um, that is what Paul is instructing them to do, to restore themselves, um, to be encouraged, right? Paraka leste. Um, his, uh, Paul is not trying to discourage them. Uh, he is not trying to tear them down. He is trying to build them up. Um, and then Paul is also encouraging them to all think the same thing, auto fronete, um, to be of one mind, all right, to, to not to be disputing each other. That's something that the Corinthians did well, to argue and to be splintered into pieces. And then finally, to be at peace, right, uh, the erenuete. Um, and, and Paul says, basically, if you do all this, then you will see the God of love and peace. And then Paul also encourages them to greet one another with a holy kiss, right? So the aspasaste, um, to greet one another, alelus, uh, with the holy kiss. And we do this, right, uh, in the Eucharist, uh, as we exchange the peace, uh, it is greeting one another uh, with uh, a kiss of agape, right, uh, uh, the kiss of love, if you will. Um, and then finally, Paul ends with this beautiful benediction, which I absolutely love, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you, be with all of you. Um, and this should sound very familiar to those of you that do the daily office, because this is one of the endings that are there. Um, and as I mentioned, this is, it's really interesting, because you see the Jesus Christ, you see God, see the Holy Spirit. And even though this is centuries before um, the, the Council of Nicaea and the developed notion of the Trinity, this is a Trinitarian benediction that um, is one of the most fully worked out Trinitarian benedictions in the New Testament. Now, it doesn't talk about the relationship between Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit, uh, but it does talk about the three. And it's very interesting because it starts with Jesus, right, as opposed to God the Father, God the Son, and then God the Holy Spirit. Um, so it starts with Jesus, goes to God, and then goes to Holy, the Holy Spirit. And so if you look at the Trinity, right, here's the diagram of the Trinity, those of you that were sort of, uh, had taken the class on the um, Nicene Creed, Deus, the Latin God is in the middle, and then P is for Pater or Father on top. On the right bottom, you have Filius, F uh, for Son, and then um, SS, Spiritus Sanctus, Holy Spirit on the left bottom. And then you see how the Pater and the Filius and the Spiritus Sanctus, S, they are all God connected in the middle. And then they are also not each other, the non-est uh, on the outside of the circle. So this is sort of your traditional way of, uh, you know, you see this a lot in stained glass windows of explaining the Trinity. 
Um, but what's so powerful is here that, um, you know, this benediction is, it, it starts with the son. Uh, he says, He caris tu curiu Jesu Christu. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, Kai, and, and then it moves to God, He agape tu theu, the love of God, Kai, and, He koinonia tu hagiu pneumatos, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Uh, koinonia, we've seen this before, that means fellowship. Um, be with all of you, meta panton humon, right? He caris tu curiu Jesu Christu, kai he agape tu theu, kai he koinonia tu hagiu pneumatos, meta panton humon, right? And so we, you, you should see this. Whenever you end the daily office, we say the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. And this is what ends morning prayer and also ends evening prayer. And so therefore we, we end of the 13th chapter of 2 Corinthians. And so the key points for today's chapter, the final chapter is Paul announces his third visit, and he says that you need to be prepared. He warns them that if they haven't shaped up, uh, that, you know, that he will be very strict with them. Uh, and this is not, you know, he is not weak. He is, he is channeling Christ's power through the resurrection. Um, he says, examine yourselves, you know, do some self-reflection beforehand. Um, and then Paul gives them a brief farewell, saying that he will see them soon. But for now, farewell. He gives them instructions on how to behave. And then he ends with the Trinitarian benediction. And um, there we have it in terms of the 13 chapters of 2 Corinthians. And so the, for the final 15 minutes, I want to step back and review the letter, this uh, epistle uh, as a whole. And sort of, um, as I mentioned before, the 2 Corinthians is one of the most challenging books in the New Testament, I believe. Uh, unless you understand the background, as we've been talking about for the last 12 classes, it's really hard to understand it. And also, it is a very disjointed letter. It, it Paul zigzags with many different themes. It's almost like a stream of consciousness. Unlike some of the other letters, the shorter letters like Galatians or even Romans, Paul is very much, you know, has a theological argument from beginning to end. Um, you know, 1 Corinthians is very clear in terms of the different topics that he covers. It's, 1 Corinthians is not so much a theological argument, but rather Paul addressing specific issues. But 2 Corinthians is basically a hodgepodge of different themes that many people have argued that 2 Corinthians is almost like a Frankenstein's monster. You know, it's, a, it's many different letters stitched together. But I want to sort of step back and argue that this is sort of a, a letter as a whole. Um, and um, so again, I think it's helpful to take a few minutes to review the letter as a whole. And um, hopefully this will then help you as you want to go back and, and look at this letter. So uh, let's take a quick journey through 2 Corinthians. The overall theme, as you know, we've talked about, is Paul's defense of his apostolic ministry, his being attacked by the Corinthians and these super apostles that we think may have come from Judea that have said that they are super apostles in terms of their credentials, um, you know, sort of, uh, and, and preaching a gospel that is different. We think perhaps the gospel, the same issue that Paul was dealing with in Galatians, sort of Judaizers, right, saying that the, the, the Mosaic law was still in place, um, sort of taking away from a gospel of grace. And so Paul rejects um, these super apostles. And the overall theme, again, is instead of arguing with the super apostles saying that Paul is as super as they are, Paul actually uses a very um, clever rhetorical technique saying that instead of being strong like them, he's actually weak. And it is through that weakness that he is actually more like Christ. Because in the same way that Christ was crucified and Christ died on a cross, Christ was weak in terms of the cross, and in the same way, Paul is weak. But then he manifests Christ's strength in the resurrection. So that's sort of the overall theme. And there are, very, there are a few key words that have come over and over again, come up over and over again, that you should know by now. Uh, Kaomai is the Greek word for to boast. 
And this word appears many times in this letter, both the boasting of the super apostles, which is bad boasting, they are boasting about themselves, and Paul's boasting, boasting of, you know, sort of, of his weakness, uh, boasting through what God, through Christ and the spirit has done for him. So there are two kinds of boasting, right? Boasting of yourself is not good. Boasting of Jesus, uh, boasting of uh, affliction, of suffering, that is good. And so the asthenia, the weakness, that is a very important word in 2 Corinthians, Paul's own weakness, which is in fact strength or power, the dunamis. Um, and again, the weakness of the world. We see this going back to 1 Corinthians, right? Um, the, God's weakness uh, is really human strength, and human weakness is God's strength, right? It's the reversal of the cross. Um, and then also the word philipsis, um, affliction. The, the Greek word for affliction is this idea of being burdened, you know, having this rock on you, philipsis. So much of 2 Corinthians is about Paul's afflictions and, and his um, sort of being afflicted by many different trials and tribulations through his ministry, which actually attest to his weakness and therefore attest to his strength in Christ. So we started off, some of you may know of this uh, BibleProject.com. If you um, sort of go there, this is, th these are these wonderful one-page cartoons of each of the books of the Bible. This is the jumping off point for the New Testament. Um, you can see that uh, each book of the New Testament, you can click on that, and you can see that there is a sort of one-page Bible uh, drawing of 2 Corinthians. And so this is a great review of the entire uh, letter. Basically, it starts with um, talking about how um, Corinth was founded, um, goes back to the book of Acts, and then how Paul heard about how things weren't going so great, which led to his writing of 1 Corinthians, all right, and then this painful visit that I talked about, and then basically the second letter that's in the New Testament, which is this letter, um, you know, which is uh, Second Corinthians, um, you know, uh, uh, that that he writes uh, to the Corinthians, and then uh, oh, also you know, with the second letter, this could be alluding to the the tearful letter that is missing, um, but then this is the follow up to that letter. And then the paradox of the cross, right, that we've been talking about, the weakness of the cross is actually God's strength. Then sort of this uh, overview says that the first seven chapters is about reconciliation. Paul talks about his journey. He has this sort of long discourse in the middle, uh, this great digression um, where he talks about the power of the gospel and the weakness of human beings. But ultimately, just as Jesus reconciles us to Jesus and to God, we are, he's been reconciled with the Corinthians through what he's heard from Titus. He then talks about generosity and giving money um, and stewardship in chapters eight and nine. He turns to a very angry voice in terms of um, the super apostles and the fool speech um, in chapters 10 through 12 and ends with his final challenge in chapter 13. So that is the arc of 2 Corinthians. And that should all sound very familiar with you if you have been sort of going through this um, series and, and uh, you know, watching the various videos online or attending the classes. And so a quick run through chapter one is the, is the typical traditional greetings where he greets the Corinthians, but instead of giving thanks for them, he gives thanks to God, which is somewhat unusual and not just any God, but a God who comforts us. And so he starts right away by talking about suffering and God's role in comforting us when we suffer. And so the beginning of this letter is actually the answer to the question, why do we suffer? Um, so any of us who have suffered, whether it's during this past year with you know, the pandemics, um, you know, suffered in our life, um, you know, Paul says one reason why we suffer is that by suffering, we can understand the suffering of others so that we can give comfort to others. So in the same way that we comfort, you know, Jesus suffers and gives us comfort so that when we suffer, we can give comfort to others. You see that? That's why we suffer. And suffering, Paul talks about he, how he had to leave Ephesus. He almost thought he died. And it was that extreme suffering that he learned to trust God. There's nothing that he could do in this awful unnamed circumstance, but only to trust God. 
and he could only hope for God's deliverance. And through that, he learned to pray to God and to give thanks to God. So these are all reasons. God doesn't want us to suffer, but if we suffer, we can make sense of that suffering by the fact that we can comfort others in the same way that God comforts us. Um, and then Paul turns to chapter one and two, where he starts to defend himself from the Corinthians. They, they say that, you know, they start, he starts off right away by explaining why he didn't go there. Remember after the tearful journey, um, he sends them a letter instead, and they say that he's, he's actually not trustworthy. Um, he says to them, look, I didn't go to you because that would make things worse. And I didn't want to make you sad. And I didn't want, you know, to make me sad. So I changed my mind. And so this was really Paul's talking about good leadership, right? He, he said, I acted with clear conscience. He said, I was flexible. Basically things changed. I decided it was not a good time to visit you. So I didn't. He was transparent. He tells them the reasons for his changing his mind. Um, he says, you know, basically it wasn't a good idea to visit you. So it's, you know, to disengage is appropriate. Sometimes, you know, we're in a bad situation and we make it worse because we refuse to disengage. You know, good spiritual leadership, you might have to disengage. And then Paul also encourages them to forgive the person that stirred things up in this second visit that was so bad, uh, that he encourages them to forgive that person because the penalty has already been paid. Then in chapters two and three, Paul talks about this Roman triumph, which is the victory march of, uh, you know, a general that has conquered, um, you know, one of these, uh, you know, after a war. And instead of the triumph, instead of Christians being the general and those who are triumphant, Paul alludes to the fact that Christians are actually those who are the prisoners. They are the ones that are brought, and, and Jesus is the general, um, not the Roman generals, but they follow another general. And so in this discussion, this begins what's called the great digression. Uh, from here to chapter seven, Paul just kind of goes off and talks about a few theological things. He talks how Christians are captives of Christ, right? In, in this triumph, they are triumphant, but they are prisoners of Christ. That instead of the aroma of death, um, we talked about the great um, triumphal march in the opera Aida, you know, sort of, uh, in, so these triumphal marches, instead of the aroma of death, the Christians are the aroma of incense um, that is sort of, you know, incense that goes up into the, um, into the heavens in terms of burnt offerings, as well as in ter terms of the incense in the triumphal march. Um, and that also he responds to um, the Corinthians asking for letters of recommendation. He says, look, I don't need any letters of recommendation, unlike the super apostles. You are my living letters of recommendation you are written on my hearts because I founded your church. Why do I need letters of recommendation when you are basically the living letters? Um, and then he goes on to talk about how the glory of the new covenant, of Jesus's covenant, is even greater than the Mosaic covenant, how Moses had a veil on, but that the, the new covenant, we actually see God's even greater glory through Jesus. And by seeing Christ, we are transformed into God's glory. Um, and so then Paul continues in chapter four by talking about, this is this uh, important thing about clay jars, right? How, how we are very fragile. Clay jars were jars that were used in kitchens that were sort of basically disposable things. If they broke, no big deal. It wasn't like really valuable pottery, but basically our ministry is from God and that we are like treasure in clay jars. The gospel is within us. Our external state is like clay jars that are fragile, Nothing special used in daily life could get broken, but what's really valuable is the gospel that is within us. And so even though we might be suffering on the outside or having a hard time, what's important is the inner nature being renewed. Our suffering is not permanent, it's temporary. And therefore we should really focus on what we can't see instead of what we can see. And then Paul goes on to this interesting metaphor. He goes from jars to tents, right? that basically our human bodies are like earthly tents. They're temporary. And, and Paul was a tent maker, right? He refused to take money from the Corinthians so that he had his daily trade. He also was a leather worker and he made tents. And he says our, our, our bodies, our fragile bodies are like earthly tents that may blow away, but that there are actually even better buildings in heaven 
And that right now, it's not a surprise that we long for not our earthly bodies, but our heavenly bodies. And he alludes to the conversation, the, the writings that he has in 1 Corinthians, at the end of 1 Corinthians, about what are heavenly bodies, that it's a continuation of our earthly bodies, but also something that is different. And then he talks about at the end of our lives, uh, there will be a resurrection and a judgment by Jesus Christ. And we should not be afraid of that judgment because Jesus has reconciled us to God through the cross. And because we have been reconciled to God, we ourselves have a ministry of reconciliation. So you see, sort of, this is sort of the most theological aspect of Paul's um, discussion in 2 Corinthians, that, that we have you know, fragile bodies uh, like clay jars, like earthly tents. Um, but in fact, we have God's, you know, the, the treasure of God's gospel within us. And part of this gospel is the reconciliation to God that we are called to reconcile ourselves. And then Paul goes on in chapter six to talk about um, the challenges of ministry, you know, the afflictions. And he says that, look, we're called to minister now. Today is the day of salvation. And doing ministry is hard work. Ministry isn't, you don't just kick back and relax. Ministry entails suffering and sacrifice um, and the use of our gifts. And ministry also entails paradox, right? Um, and so what does he mean by that? So, you know, you may be try thinking that you are acting with honor, but people think that you are dishonorable. You are trying to have good repute, but you are blamed for ill repute. You're trying to be true, but people claim that you're imposters, right? That you are think you may be well-known, but you're unknown, and you're alive, but you are dying. So those of us that do ministry, you know, baptismal ministry, it's not easy, right? Sometimes you think you're doing things, and yet you are seen to be doing the opposite. That is the paradox of ministry. And then Paul continues by encouraging the Corinthians to open their hearts. And then there's this funny passage about being, don't being to not be differently yoked, like two oxen, to have different yoked oxes. Um, people think that this language is very different. Um, some people have interpreted it as not being yoked with non-Christians. Um, I think it can also be meant as a as sort of a criticism of the super apostles, to not be differently yoked with someone that is preaching a different gospel. Chapters 7 and 8 is about reconciliation then. The, the great digression ends Paul says again, open your hearts, Corinthians. You know, I am glad that we're reconciled with each other. I heard from Titus coming back. You know, Paul explains how he went to Troas and then goes to Macedonia. He says, I hear that you've been we've been reconciled to each other. I'm really happy. And the Macedonians, by the way, Paul says, has been really generous. They've given all this money for the Jerusalem offering. You should be like them because I've bragged about you. Um, and then he says that you should be poor like Christ, just like Christ emptied himself. Um, you should empty yourself of your riches and be poor to give uh, to Jerusalem and help one another, help the other churches. He moves to chapters eight and nine about generosity, giving, and stewardship. Those of you that are interested in the theology of stewardship, this is great to look at. He says in collecting money, we have to be blameless. So he sends Titus to them. He sends this well-known apostle that people think might be St. Luke. He sends another apostle that has been tested. So instead of going to collect money himself, he sends other people so that he will be blameless. Um, he says that he's sending them so they'll be prepared. Um, they won't be caught off guard when he goes and sees them because they promised him that they, they are collecting money. He encourages them to be generous and also to be thankful that giving should be coming out of one's thankfulness. And you give, you the more generous you are, the more you give, and then the more you get. Chapter 10 is then when the tone changes, he's all sort of reconciled with them, and all of a sudden it becomes sort of very angry. And Paul starts chapter 10 with this Roman warfare. Remember, we were talking about warfare and attacking the walls of cities and sort of all these ways in which uh, Romans tore down the walls. And Paul uses warfare language, but he says that we wage war by God's standards, not ours. And he's talking about the super apostles. He's saying things aren't always what they seem. The apostles are saying that he's weak, but he's actually not weak. He's weak by Christ's standards, which is strong. Um, and then Paul criticizes um, the super apostles by saying that 
we should spread the gospels to regions beyond, but they have overstepped themselves. They've gone to sort of the regions that were assigned to him. Um, and then Paul also says that, you know, we should boast in the Lord, not ourselves, criticizing the super apostles. And then he also warns them about not being deceived, like Eve was deceived by the serpent in the Garden of Eden, again, alluding to the craftiness of the super apostles. Chapter 11, Paul goes and talks about the fool's speech, as we talked about, that he acknowledges being a fool, but a fool for Christ, that he values the knowledge of Christ over rhetoric, that the super apostles were really good with speaking, but their content left something to be desired. That again, he justifies the importance of being financially independent. So he did not want to be patrons of the Corinthian church. That's why he didn't take money from them. Um, he warns them of being aware of Satan's disguised servants, again, the, the super apostles. Then he engages in what he calls foolish boasting about suffering. This is where Paul talks about all the ways in which he suffers. And then also foolish boasting about his weaknesses, that Paul actually runs away. He escapes from a window through a wall, as opposed to using warfare, you know, sort of the opposite of Roman strength just like how he turns the idea of a triumph on his head, he turns Roman warfare on its head. And then chapter 12, as we talked about last time, we heard about Paul's vision of the third heaven. Paul was caught up into the third heaven, and he says, in order to be humble, God gave him a thorn in his flesh. We don't know what this thorn was, but it was to keep him humble. And the high point of the letter was that this thorn he asked for the thorn to be taken away, and Jesus said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. Power is made perfect in weakness, that in your weakness, in the thorn, that is where God's power is. And Paul again says he does not want to burden the Corinthians, and then he talks about his fears about his upcoming visit. Finally, today we talk about chapter 13, to be prepared, Paul's third visit, his warning for them to shape up, his urging, he's instructing them to examine themselves, and then finally his farewell and benediction. So there you have it. You have your journey of 2 Corinthians. I've talked also about how it relates to 1 Corinthians. And again, this is sort of the key verse. If, if you take anything away from these 12 weeks, uh, think about 2 Corinthians 12, 9, 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. Arke soy he karismu he gar dunamis in astenea teletai. That Christ says, Christ's grace is sufficient for all of us. We don't need to be powerful. We don't need to do things. All we need is God's grace. And in our weakness, God's power is made perfect. Just like in the cross, we should not be afraid of our weaknesses. It is through our weakness that God's power is made perfect. And that is at the heart of Second Corinthians, and that is at the heart of the cross and of the gospel. And so again, the thorn in our flesh, you may be experiencing thorns in your flesh, whether they're physical, whether they're spiritual, whether they're metaphorical, but know that God's grace is sufficient for you and that power is made perfect in your weakness. And so we have covered chapter 13, Paul's third verse, warning, examining, themselves, the farewell and benediction. We've reviewed 2 Corinthians. And again, I invite you to go to the YouTube channel uh, to view this class or the other classes. And I'd like to end with a closing prayer. Please join me in a closing prayer, a, a wonderful collect about scripture. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. And so we have reached the end of this class. We have reached the end of this series on 2 Corinthians. And we have reached the end of our journey through Paul's correspondence with his beloved Corinthian church. Thank you for joining us. And may God continue to bless you and nourish you with God's word.